Hello, hello. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to be here tonight with everybody. This is a little different. I'm a new face. Well, I'm not new, but I'm new here in this spot. Um, Brother Scotty and his family are out for vacation this week, and he asked me to step in for him. So I said, okay, brother, we'll give it a go. I don't know how it's going to go, but I know the Holy Spirit's going to take over. So uh, it's so good to be here tonight, and it's good to see your faces. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I didn't eat too much. Some of y'all look like y'all ate a little too much. Just falling asleep back there. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm good. I had two earlier. <laughs> Amen. Well, tonight we are um, we're going to talk about the feeling of fear, the action of faith, fear versus faith. Amen. And we're going to start in uh, the book of Joshua in chapter one. So if y'all will turn there. Amen. You know, when God calls you to step out on faith and 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 teach his word and, and do what he has called us to do, his purpose while we're here. Don't think that Satan is going to sit back and just let you do it. Amen? This week has been kind of trying. In fact, yesterday, uh, my daughter had a wreck. And don't think he won't use your kids to take you out or to discourage you. Um, but I knew that's what it was. And praise be to God, she's okay. Everybody's okay. But that was just his way of trying to discourage me not to get up here, not to, not to step out on his faith. But all it takes is just a little bit of faith. Amen? So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started in his word. Amen? So if you would, bow your heads. Father God, I just I thank you for calling me here tonight, Lord. I thank you that you're such a good God. Amen. And, and that no matter what comes our way, Lord, you're always there and you never stop chasing us. Father God, I pray tonight that your message be heard, Lord, not mine, yours. I, I just, I want to lay myself to the side. There's nothing about me that's worthy to do this, Lord, but you called me and I pray that the Holy Spirit takes over tonight, Lord. I, I, give, I give him all the reins, Lord. God, I just pray that your people are ready to hear your word, Lord, and that they hear whatever your message is tonight, Lord. And Father God, I just thank you and I praise you. And I pray that as we leave here today, Lord, that no matter what, you, they know that you love them, Lord. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So before we get started, here in Joshua in chapter 1, we know that Moses has died. Most of us know the story of Joshua. But before we get into that, I think it's important that we go back a little bit and, and get into some of the background info that leads us to this position. So before Joshua, God called Moses, right? And he called Moses when Moses was uh, in the land of Midian. Um, Moses, as a baby, was supposed to die. But his mom kept him hidden. The Pharaoh in that time had ordered a decree to kill all the babies, um, two and under, male, the male babies. But his mom was, knew that Moses was destined for great things. So she kept him hidden for three months. And then after three months, she couldn't hide him anymore. So she made a basket that floated on water. And then she put Moses in the basket and prayed over him and asked God to keep him protected. So she sent him down the river. Well, his sister Miriam... Uh, kept watch over him as he floated in the river, and he eventually floated to the Pharaoh's daughter's porch thing there. And so the Pharaoh's daughter found him and took him in. And then Miriam went and asked the Pharaoh's daughter, do you want an Israelite woman to raise him until he's able to come back? And so the Pharaoh agreed. So God is working in all this. So Moses was able to stay with his real family until he was about 12 years old. So then at 12, he goes back to the king's palace because now he is considered a prince. He's the daughter of the Pharaoh, right? So 
at 12, he starts getting educated. He learns great wisdom, very educated man, and, and he's getting prepared what the Pharaoh thought was going to take maybe over him, for him someday. Well, while he's, after he gets educated older, he's out trolling the grounds, looking over things, and he comes across an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave. And we know the story. He ends up killing the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Well, Moses thought, well, I got away with it. No one knows. But the truth of it was they did know, and there was a lot of talk about it. So he got scared because he knew that if the Pharaoh found out, he was going to die. So he ran away. He ran away, and he went to the land of Midian. And while in Midian, he married the Midianite woman, Zephora, I believe was her name, and uh, became a shepherd. And while he was tending the sheep at the age of 40, God called him from the burning bush. And he told Moses, I want you to lead my people out of Israel. And of course, Moses was like, you're talking to me because I don't know how to speak. There's no way I would be the one. Do you know what God said? Well, it doesn't matter because I am who I am and I'm sending you. And so he sent Aaron, his brother, with him. And they went back to Egypt. And while in Egypt, they go to the Pharaoh and, and Moses is like, I want you to let my people go. And the Pharaoh's like, it ain't happening. And Moses is like, yeah, I need you to let my people go. And he's like, it ain't happening, Jack. So then, God sends the plagues, the ten plagues, and the last one being the death of the firstborn son. Those that not put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, then the firstborn son, when the death angel came through, he would take them. Well, because the Pharaoh did not, was not a, a God-believing man, his firstborn died. And so after that, he decided that he was going to let the Israelites go, and he told Moses, take your people and go. So he took them, and he left, and they went to, they got to the Red Sea, or the, yeah, the Red Sea, and they camped there, and then the next day, they were getting ready to leave, and they saw the Egyptians coming. And so God told Moses, take, my, take the staff, go stand over the water, and hold it out. And so Moses did, and God split the Red Sea. He parted the waters. And so all the Israelites crossed. And as soon as the last Israelite crossed, he let it go, and all the Egyptians died. Okay? So then from there, they go to Mount Sinai. They're, they're on their journey to Mount Sinai. Now, during this time, God is, per, is, is doing all these miracles. He is performing miracle after miracle after miracle, the Red Sea was a miracle. So on their journey through the wilderness, they come to uh, Mara, and the water is bitter. It's bitter water. It's nasty. It's gross. You can't drink it. So God turns the water to sweet water so they can drink it. Then they get through there, and they're going into the wilderness of sin, and they start complaining, oh, Lord, why, it would just be better to be left in Egypt, because now we're going to die from hunger, and so God is like, okay, so he gave them manna in the morning, and quail in the evening, right, and then, if that wasn't enough, they come to Horeb, and there's no water to drink, so he tells Moses, go take my staff, and strike the rock, so that water can come out. And so Moses did, and they got water from a rock. And then during that time, they had their first battle with Amalek in Rephidim. And during this battle, Moses called on Joshua to lead men, to, to pick men and go out and fight. So while they're out fighting, the Lord says, as long as Moses holds my staff up, the Israelites will prevail. But if he drops it, they're going to die. So they're like, okay, we got this. So Joshua goes out and starts fighting. Well, he sends Aaron and her up with him. Thank goodness, because they probably would have died, because I don't know about y'all, but when I be praising the Lord, my hands get tired, and I just be like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I got to put one down. 
and then I got to put the other one back up. So Moses' hands started getting tired from holding his staff up. So they prop a rock under him, and then one on each side, they hold his hands up, and they won. The Israelites won. So after that, they built an altar, and they named it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Well, then after that, they get to the base of Mount Sinai. And during the first year there, God kept them there, and I believe it was because he wanted to rebuild the relationship with them. He had not spoken to his people in 430 years. So he wanted to rebuild the relationship that, that was lost. He wanted his people to believe in him again, to trust him again. So during that year, and then the second year is the year that he gave them the Ten Commandments. Um, and then, of course, they built a golden staff, and then Moses got angry and broke the stones, and then he had to rewrite them. But this time period is what kept them from entering the Promised Land, this generation. This was when he sent 12 spies into the Promised Land. The two of the 12 were Joshua and Caleb. So they went in to spy the land, and they all came back, and they all had a good report that the land was fruitful. It was amazing. There was honey and huge fruit, and I mean, it was just full of fruit and produce, right? But 10 out of those people said, oh, but there's giants over there, and we ain't having it, and I don't think we can take it. And they discouraged the people, but out of those 12, Joshua and Caleb was like, so what? There's giants over there. God said, we're going to take it. We're going to take it. But because of those 10, they got discouraged. And God said, well, that's it. I've had enough. It's like talking to my kids. That's it. I've had enough. And he said, this generation will not go into the promised land. And so for the next 38 years, they wandered in the promised land until all people 20 and over died. And Moses gives his farewell speeches in the book of Deuteronomy before he dies. He was not allowed to enter the promised land. So this is where we're at. Moses has died at 120 years old, and they, the people mourn for 30 days. So after the mourning of Moses, God has called them. So I'm going to read in the, in the first chapter. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage." Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. So here we're at the book of Joshua, and Moses has died, and now God has appointed Joshua as the new leader of the Israelites. In other words, he has commissioned Joshua. And commission means he has instructed, commanded, or it's his duty. It's now his duty to lead the Israelites into the promised land. So God is commanding Joshua to step up and lead his people. Now, the book of Genesis is what I believe to be called the beginnings, right? And then the book of Exodus is the book of redemption. 
the book of Leviticus is called the book of holiness, and the book of Numbers is the book of testing. Deuteronomy is the book of instruction and wisdom for obeying God's word. Then you have the book of Joshua, and the book of Joshua is what I call the book of acting on faith. Amen? So if we could summarize the book of Joshua, it would be this, the law of believing. You see, sometimes I think God waits to act until you move in faith. Now let that sink in for a minute. Sometimes you have to step out on faith before he will move. He wants to see action to your talking. He wants to see you walk the walk instead of just talk the talk, right? Abraham, for example, was a man who acted on his faith. God called Abraham out of his home, homeland in Ur, and he told Abraham, I'm going to take you out. I want you to go out of your land because I'm going to take you to the land that I promised you. Now, Abraham had no what was going to happen. He had no clue how he was going to live, you know, what he was going to wear, um, or any of that. But he trusted God, and he stepped out on his faith. He was out of his comfort zone. He was out of his safe place. Uh, <clears throat> he took his wife, their belongings, and he followed God. And God told Abraham seven times of his promise to him. Seven times. Okay? That he was going to make him a father of many nations. In fact, the sixth time he told uh, Abraham this promise, Abraham fell face down and laughed. You see, Sarah wasn't the only one who laughed. Abraham laughed too. And that's what Isaac means, laughter. Then the Lord told Abraham to take his only son, the one he promised him, the one that he said was going to make him a father of many nations, and he told him, I want you to take Isaac up, and I want you to sacrifice him on the altar to me. Now, I don't know about y'all, but me personally, I love my kids. There is no way that I, I don't think I would be able to do it. I'm just going to be honest. I don't think that in my heart of hearts, I don't think I would have been able to take my child up knowing that I'm about to kill him. But you see, Abraham knew something a little bit more than what we did. Abraham trusted God. And when God makes a promise, he cannot unfulfill it. And he knew God was either going to save a Isaac or he was going to bring him back from the dead. So he took Isaac up, and he took his servants, and they got to where they were going, and he told his servants, y'all wait here. We are going to come back when we're done. So when he got up there, he built the altar, and he laid Isaac down on the altar, and he reared back. Right before he came down, an angel stopped him and said, Stop. And the Lord said, now I know you love me. Amen? That's called faith, guys. Faith in standing on his promise. Standing on what you know to be true. So afterwards, Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. But you have the prophet Elijah as well, who called out the prophets on Baal at Mount Carmel. His faith moved God to answer by fire, and God answered by a fire so hot that no one had ever seen anything like it before. What happens when you soak wood? Can you light it? If you really soak it down after a good rain, you can't light it. But we don't serve a God that can't light anything. We serve a God who lights it so hot that it burns everything up. Everything. And so the prophets were like, what? Because of Elijah's faith, God answered him. God answered him. And let's not forget about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know this story. They believed in their God, and they would not bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar. And they told him, it doesn't matter what you do or what you say. We will never bow down to you. And we know our God can. And even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to you. And so they went into that fiery furnace and I believe Jesus was there with them. 
King Nebuchadnezzar said, I, is that the son of man in there? You see, God sometimes waits for us to step out on our faith and act on it before he moves. So here we are in the first chapter of Joshua, and God is commanding him to lead his people into the promised land. And Joshua knows what lies ahead. He knows what they're up against. He's already seen what's in the promised land, right? He's already scoped it out. He knows there's giants, sons of Anak, in the promised land, right? But he was also one of the two who believed that they could take the land. So here, Joshua has two options. Act on faith, trusting that God's promise still stands and that they already have the victory, or bow out in fear because the giants still run the land and he doesn't have the courage it takes to act on his faith. You see, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, God tells him to be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance to the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And then he says again in verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. You see, it doesn't matter what you feel because our feelings will lie to us. They will tell us that we can't. They will tell us that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we're not strong enough. So we have to push those back because we know that God's word says we are more than conquerors through him. Amen? And so Joshua did that. So what is faith? Well, Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For example, the wind. We can't technically see it. It has no color. It has no physical feeling. But when it blows, you see the effects of it. The leaves move. Your hair moves. But you can see the effects of the wind. Your breath is another example. You can't see your breath until it gets cold outside. And then you see it. It's smoke in the air. But we know that it's there, right? Faith is a, is a decision that we make about where we're going to put our trust. Faith is putting into action the thing that we believe. You know, faith is giving us to us by God. We are given faith by God. We already have the exact amount of faith that we need to overcome fear. In fact, it says in Romans 12 and 3, for I say, through grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So everybody already has a measure of faith they need to overcome whatever comes, whatever trial, whatever discouragement, whatever the enemy tries to give to us or deal to us, we face to overcome it. He's already given us that. So what is fear? Have you ever been afraid of something? Okay, so like I'm terrified of snakes. I'm not even going to lie. Like, me and snakes, we don't coexist, okay? Like, tell y'all a little story. I'm going to tell them myself. When we first moved here about three years ago, we lived in our first greenhouse, and I'm walking outside to go clean my trash can because it's nasty. And so I'm walking out, and I'm walking, and I walk by this thing, and I stopped about probably six inches from it. I was like, man, that tree branch looks really weird. And, I, it, and then the light bulb comes on, bing! And I'm like, oh my God, it's a snake. And I'm like freaking out and I'm shaking and I have this trash can in my hand and I'm like, flight, fight or flight kicks in and I throw the trash can at the snake and I take off. And it's just this little tiny um, grass snake. <laughs> but I don't like snakes. Now, some of y'all don't like um, spiders. Miss Cody don't. We know that. Poor Cody. I feel bad for her. But some of us don't like to get up and talk in front of people. We're scared to death to speak in public. Uh, 
Some of us have a fear of death. You know, those of us that, those, those that don't believe, they, they fear death because they don't know what, what's going to happen. But those who believe shouldn't fear death because we know. We know where we're going. We know the end and we know what's going to happen. Some people are afraid of drowning. They're afraid of water. You have all these different fears. Man, like my sister is so terrified of June bugs. Like when we were kids, I remember chasing her through the house one time with one, and she ran right into the glass door. It was so bad. But there's a lot of things that we're scared of. But you know what? Fear, it's just false evidence appearing real. That's all it is. Okay, like, I don't do scary movies either. Like, so don't do scary movies. In fact, scary movies and I, like, when I watch a scary movie, I dream about it for, like, days. I can't, like, when that Paranormal Activities movie came out, I was up for three weeks. I'm a grown woman, and I slept in the bed with my mother at 4 o'clock in the morning. I was like, Mom, scoot over. I'm coming in. I couldn't sleep. Like, I don't like scary movies. And then after you watch one, you're like creeping through the house and you're like turning every light on, like turn the lights on. Any darkness in here. And I wouldn't sleep with my feet out from the covers because I was afraid something was going to get me. Yeah, I don't know. Nah. So listen, but here's the point. Joshua had a choice to make. He has a choice to make at this point. God's saying, I want you to take my people and go across this river and take that land that I've already told you I'm giving you. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't scared. I'm not saying he didn't have fear. The Bible doesn't say anything about him having fear. But it does talk about him having faith. You see, that's the way the enemy tries to get in. He's going to constantly count you with well, what if you get up there and you just fail? Well, then I'm going to fail big. But what if you get up there and you stutter? You know, my son, when he was little, he used to have a stuttering problem. Can't tell it now because he talks forever. But when he was little, he would get really excited and he would be like, ma, mama, 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 and I would have to calm him down and say, slow down. All right. Now I'll talk to mama, you know? Um, the point is, he didn't let it control him. See, when you feel fear, don't let it stop you. Remind it of who is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We are overcomers. You cannot let fear stop you. You can't t let it tell you. If God is for you, who can be against you? You have to remind it where it goes, where it needs to stay. You see, in verse 6, God is commanding Joshua to be strong and courageous. The word courage in the Hebrew language is omets. Um, it means courage. It means strength or heart strength. The word shazak vehemence means to be strong and courageous in the Hebrew language. In fact, they continue to say that phrase in Israel to this day. They say shazak vehemence, which means be strong and courageous. And they say it still in, in Israel. God encourages Joshua three different times to be strong and courageous. Joshua is going to have to be the example of what courage is to the Israelites because these people are stiff-necked people. If one little tiny thing goes wrong or they don't get their way, man, they whine like babies. Sounds like my kids, my five-year-old. But Grammy... You know, he was ser Moses' servant for 40 years in the wilderness. So he witnessed firsthand how ridiculously difficult the Israelites could be, right? 
They would whine when they didn't get their way or when it took too long. My, my kids do that. We go to the grocery store and they're like, are we done yet? Oh my gosh, can we go? This is so boring. But the key to accessing this strength and courage is actually found in verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. You see, only when we continue to study God's word and keep it in our mind and in our heart and on our tongue constantly, day and night, obey it, will we be spiritually strengthened by God's presence wherever we go. Because he said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen. John 14 Verses 15 through 17 states, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Out of love for God, we obey him. Out of love for God, we obey him. And in return, he strengthens us so that we can obey him more fully. And we can continue to grow and be stronger. And when we put his strength, when the more of his strength that, we, that he gives us as we grow, the more we can put into practice of being strong and obeying his word and standing on faith, and the stronger and more proficient we come, we, we become in, in using it. And the more courageous we become, the more we begin to step out on faith and be bold. He told us to be bold, to be strong, courageous, be bold in the faith. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You know, M Nelson Mandela once said that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. John Wayne, one of my favorites, he said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. My brother was a bull rider in high school. And my mom was, we were so scared to death. But my brother, he would look that fear in the eye and go, I got you, brother. And he'd climb on that bull every time. And we would just be in the stands like, Lord, please just let him make it through. Mark Twain. Mark Twain is the author of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, one of my, couple of my favorite books. And he said that courage is the resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not the absence of fear. You see, Joshua conquered fear by having faith in God. He did not let the enemy tell him he wasn't good enough. He didn't let him tell him he was not smart enough. He didn't let him tell him that he wasn't strong enough. He put his faith in God. God already told him in verse 6 that the land was his. He, are, he reminded Joshua of his promise that he had already made to Abraham many, many, many years before Joshua came. And he told Joshua, go get your promised land. Go across the Jordan and take that land and take my people across and do what I've already promised you would, would happen. Let me tell you something, though. Every time that we set our hearts and minds to have faith, 
spirit's sure to follow, right? When Brother Scotty first asked me a couple weeks ago to get up here and teach tonight, I was like, you want me to do what? I mean, like, I'm a talker, but I'm not, I'm not, this is out of my area. I've never really, I've taught Sunday school, small group of people, you know, little kids, but I've never got up here and actually had to put a whole sermon together. But then I was like, you know what? All that time of teaching is what he was preparing me for, for tonight. And God said to be ready in season and out of season, right? So I was like, okay, Lord, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna let you have it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know you do. So you see, I truly believe you cannot pray away fear. You, I just don't believe it. In fact, the devil is constantly attacking us through fear. Fear is always there. There's never a moment that goes by that something will pop into my head and I'll be like, oh my goodness, and then I have to rein it back in. You can, however, pray for courage to overcome the feeling of fear. Amen. God said that we would never be tempted without a way out, without giving a way out. And that way out is prayer, being in his word, knowing what he says, who he is, what he stands for. That is the way out. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Joshua had a lot of adversaries going to look him in the eye when he crossed that Jordan, right? But he didn't care. Do you honestly think that Satan is going to let you walk around and win victory after victory without a fight? No. He, he tried to take my kid out last night. But you know what? God is bigger and he's stronger. And no matter what, I know that God forbid, but I know that if anything had happened, he had her. And I know that he is my comforter, my healer, and I know where she would have been if it did happen. And I would have stood on that belief. You know, Satan, he roams the earth seeking to devour you. He doesn't want God's people to be victorious. He don't want us to be victorious. In fact, he doesn't want God's people to know that without a shadow of a doubt what his word says, and he sure doesn't want you to obey it. He wants us to live a life full of sin because when we're living a life full of sin, he don't bother us. It's when you step out and you say, no, I'm going to change and I'm going to do what, what God's word says and I'm going to be the woman or the man in Christ that he has called me to be. That's when he shows up. That's when he comes knocking at your door. You see, from the, God, the time God calls us to the time we say yes, me and Ben were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, that short time period or that long time period, however long it takes, that's the enemy's battlefield. You see, your mind is his battlefield. When God calls you to do something, whether it's get up and go talk to that young lady over there, if you wait too long, you won't do it. You'll talk yourself out of it. You'll justify, oh, she's okay. She doesn't look like she needs me. But I'm not, I'm not red. I, I don't have the words to say to her. God said, but I do. If you take too long and step out in faith, the enemy will take hold of your thoughts and you will get discouraged. This is why it is so important to take every single thought that pops into your head, into your mind, and compare it to God's word. And if it doesn't line up, if it doesn't say, yes, this is okay, then you need to throw it out. When God spoke to me about teaching tonight, my fear level went from zero to like 150. And my thoughts were going like 90 miles an hour. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Me? 
But the enemy was there too, and he was like, girl, you know you ain't never taught like this before. Do you really know God's word well enough to teach? What, what makes you think you're good enough? What if you get up there and you leave everything at home? Well, I would have said, all right, Lord, I'm going to do a new sermon call all by myself. Just kidding. But God's word told me, for I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. See, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor, neither let it be afraid. You see, fear, feeling fear is not being afraid. It's just a feeling. Being afraid is caving into the fear and doing what it says instead of doing what God is telling you to do. Joshua doesn't hesitate. He didn't get down on the ground and tear his clothes because that's what they did back in the day and cry and whine about how, Lord, these people are terrible. You want me to lead them across the ocean, the, the sea? You want me to take these terrible people over there and, and just give them this land? He didn't do that. He didn't run away or get all dramatic. You ever got dramatic on God? Oh man, I did one time. It was bad. It was so bad. I was, I lived with my mom at the time. It was time period where we were going through some, some really bad things with my brother. And I remember God, he called me to do some things and my mom was mad at me and I was just like, my favorite thing to do was to go outside and build a little fire and sit out where my mom lives at. It's really open sky. And I just love to just sit out late at night, just me and God, and, and just have that peace time after the kids went to bed, just kind of mellow out. But this particular night, I was so angry and I was so mad. And I was like, why? I was laying on the ground and I was laying in dirt. And I was like, oh my gosh, you called me to do this. And you said, it was. and I was laying on the ground, and then I was like, this is it. This is all that it is. I'm just going to give up. I'm done. You can have it. And I remember hearing him as white. If, if rice is white, I mean, I heard him clearly. He was like, really? You're going to give up? You're going to let me have it? Finally. <gasps> Praise the Lord. And I was like, whatever, God. But you know what? You see, faith, without faith, we cannot walk in and receive God's blessings. You have to believe. It just takes a mustard seed. Just a mustard seed. If Joshua would not have believed God, they would have spent another 40 years going around the mountain till he comes. He'd have been like, that's it, go back around the mountain. They would have spent another 40 years, or God would have said, I'm done with y'all. You know? But they didn't. He didn't. He believed God. In fact, the only time we should ever stop having godly faith in something is when we see it manifested. Not how long it takes, or how hard it is, or the lies that the enemy want to tell you. The only time we should stop having godly faith is when it is manifested. For example, manifested. If you are praying for a car, and your old one breaks down, and you need a new one, right? So you're praying, Lord, I don't want to use Pat and Ben to walk to work every day. So, he blesses you with a car. Well, now you don't have to keep having faith for that. He already gave it to you. You can take that faith and put it elsewhere. There was a bee. I have a story for you. There was a bee who was on a space shuttle, and they were being sent off to another planet. So once it got into space, you know, gravity's not there anymore, so he's just floating around. He doesn't have to use his wings anymore. He's floating around. Just living life, just floating 
Oh, hallelujah, this is so glorious. He was just floating, there was no gravity. He didn't have to do anything. Well, the end of the story was the bee enjoyed the ride, but he died. See, this is exactly what happens to us when all we do is just float around. Oh, praise you, Lord. I'm just going to be spiritual. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But you know what? If all we did was float around and be spiritual, we wouldn't develop our faith and we wouldn't grow. Eaglets, they have a little tooth on the end of their beak, right? And they use this tooth to peck away at their shell. It takes hours, sometimes even days, to crack it open. Could you imagine if that was us, if we were eaglet? All we had to do, all that pecking. Oh my goodness, come on God, for real, this is enough pecking. Can we just get out already? Well, there was a man who saw this happen, and he felt bad for the eaglet. So he went and he helped the eaglets get out. Well, the eaglet died. See, it needed to be able to, to complete the pecking. He needed that opposition. Without opposition, we can't grow and be strong in God's word or stand on our faith if we do not have it. God gives us opposing sides because he wants us to choose him. It's a choice. We can't be robots, like Brother Scotty says. We can't just be robots. Because then what is that? If we're walking around praising God, I love you, God. Thank you, God. It would be monotone. I love you, God. Like the red eye guy. But God doesn't want that. Romans 15, 13 says that joy and peace are found in believing. There is joy and peace when you believe in God's word. When we trust God, our spirits are happy. You have to believe. Mark eleven thirty two 32 says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. It does not say that. It doesn't say you have it yet. Sometimes... You won't see the things that you're praying for, but you have to believe that they're there. When Abraham was told that he was going to make a father of many nations, he did not live to see that the promised land came to existence, but he believed in it, and he stood on it, and he trusted God's word. Joshua never doubted that the Israelites could take the promised land. In fact, he believed and God saw his heart while he was preparing him under Moses in the wilderness. It just takes faith. I'm almost done, I promise. See, faith does not come without being tested. Because how can you have a message unless you go through a mess? How can you have a testimony that you can share with someone else without having been tested in the fire? You cannot give a word to someone and encourage them if you haven't been through anything. Joshua had already been through it. He watched this generation's parents and grandparents fail because they didn't believe. But he believed, and he knew that God could not go back on his promises. And he knew that God was going to be there for him. He told him he was going to be there for him. In fact, in verse 9, it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God knew there was going to be obstacles that the Israelites were going to face. He knew the river was flooded at this time of the year. He knew there was giants in the land. And, you know, Joshua was not a spring chicken anymore. He was eight, almost 80 years old at this time. But he knew God would not go back on his promises. And he knew that faith without works is dead. And he trusted God, and he stood on his faith, and he took charge of the Israelites, and he led them into the battlefield. 
Because if he knew God was for him, who could be against him? When we go to the Lord in prayer and we are dealing with the feeling of fear, we need to ask him for strength, for boldness, for courage. Even though I'm scared, Lord, I need you to be with me. I need you to help me step out. Give me the, the courage to not listen to what the enemy is telling me. The confidence for power to endure whatever comes with good temper and not get angry and be mad and sulky and whining. To give us that kind of faith that never gives up, that never quits, that never stops. To just take charge and Man, when I first became a believer, I'm going to tell you what, I wanted to charge hell with a water gun. Shh, 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 let's go. You know? But then life gets you, and you, you keep going, and man, it gets rough. But the more you lay, you stay on his word, and you meditate in it day and night, the more you take every thought captive, and you really think about what's going through your mind. What? What? Did that really just pop into my head? That's not right. The only way to access that is by meditating on his word in day and night. That's the only thing that's the only thing that's going to to keep your faith in check. It's the only thing that's going to keep you believing is to know who he is, who he says he is. He is it's the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He's unchanging, unwavering. He is unconditional. He loves us. He gave his only son for us. And all he wants us to do is choose him. Believe in him. So tonight, I encourage you guys, whatever God is calling you to do, whatever he's telling you that you need to do, whether it's speak to someone or forgive somebody or go be a missionary somewhere. My daughter's heart is missionary, has been for a long time. No matter what, step out in faith. Don't let the enemy discourage you from it. Because I know if he can take someone like me and get me up here and talk in front of all of y'all, then I know that he can do you the same way. Just takes a little bit of faith. A little bit of faith. I pray that y'all take this word home tonight. That's all I have for y'all. Um, I pray that y'all take this word home and really study it. Don't believe everything I tell you. It is very important for you to go get the word for yourself. Um, for you, because it's for you. You need to know it. You can't fight your battles if you don't know his word. Amen? Anybody else have anything tonight?